Hi everyone, Stepan here. In today's video I'm going to finish covering the games from the Bad Vorishofen tournament. Uh, okay, so before I start looking at the games, the final stats in the tournament were I, I earned 16 yellow points, which considering how the tournament started is pretty bad, because after the first four rounds I was 25 uh, up, so the second part of the tournament was pretty bad. But still, I think I think considering the circumstances, the circumstances, it went well, and I'm finally over 1900 again. So I'm 1909 on the new rating list. Uh, the two final games were influenced a lot by the situation in the world and in Croatia and my potential to to not be able to get home. So before the final round, I got an email from Flixbus saying that my bus has been cancelled which I, I remember calling my family and saying I, I don't know if I'll be able to get home and they told me just focus on the game and we'll see what happens and so I went and played. Okay, uh, it was weird and I barely managed to get home uh, as you may know. Uh, I didn't even play the, the ninth round. These were rounds seven and eight so round nine was the next day which I, I ran away basically. During the evening, without dinner, without anything, I, I caught the final bus, uh, the last bus, and the only bus that day from Bad Vorishofen to, to Munich, and then I managed to get home. I was at the border for 20 hours. So, uh, I wasn't really focused on chess during these two rounds. I, I'm sure nobody was, but for me, I, I, I feel like that's very strange. I don't ever remember not putting chess first. I mean... I always thought, regardless of what's going on in the outside world, I'm going to be focused. But yeah, in these two games, I really wasn't. So the first game was against a 1945 player. I'd prepared a lot for him because he plays weird, different Slav or uh, systems with white against the Slav and the semi-Slav. And uh, we went to the, into the semi-Slav. So c4, c6, knight f3, knight f6, e3, e6. And here uh, he played the quiet slav to start with. He played e3 before knight c3, which can lead to, to different types of variations. In these positions, uh, bishop f5 is, is, of course, the most aggressive move for black. Bishop g4 is also a very good move. a6 can be played, g6 can be played. But I wanted to go for e6, my normal setup, and I was hoping for knight c3. He went knight bd2, and now the difference is, if I ever take on c4, uh, I don't win a tempo on the bishop. So after knight bd7, bishop d3, the bishop hasn't lost the tempo. If I take, he doesn't have to recapture with the bishop. So he can take, take, take with the knight. And I wasn't really familiar with these systems. Uh, turned out that I played a lot of theory in this game, and I didn't know it. And even though it was theory, I thought it was extremely unpleasant for me. And I thought I was losing this game, uh, well, for the bigger part of it. And my opponent spent little spent little to no time. I'd spent almost an hour on the next seven moves. Okay, so bishop d6, normal. Castles, castles, e4, very normal. Uh, now here, of course, I can either take on play e or play e5, and this I knew, but I couldn't see what happens after e5. So this was my calculation, so e5. I'm sorry, uh, e5, uh, c takes d5, I was expecting, c takes d5, and now e takes d5 was my uh, was what I thought should be played, and now e takes d4. And after knight e4, I had no idea what this position was like. Uh, so I, I pictured something like this, and then I thought there's there are these two pawns in the center, so I'm going to take the knight, he's going to take with the bishop, I'm going to play knight f6, and what's going on here? And then I saw bishop g5, and then I figured, well... I could have this exact position without losing a pawn because eventually I'm going to lose the d4 pawn and then who knows if I'll be able to recapture the d5 pawn. So here was my analysis at home. So here I would play bishop e7 and now bishop takes f6, bishop takes f6, knight takes d4. And I wasn't sure how I was supposed to recapture this pawn. Then uh, I, w I looked into the databases and it turns out that this is a variation that's played. There are 20 or so games from this position and apparently black is fine because he has the bishop pair and this pawn is sort of isolated and weak. But during the game I, I just couldn't see all of that. I just thought I'm losing a pawn, it's complicated, I don't want to struggle with that. So I played d4. 
and after knight takes e4, knight takes e4, bishop takes e4 here, uh, this is basically a Karo Khan with my bishop still on c8, which is something I'm very familiar with because I played play the Karpov Karo Khan. Uh, instead of bishop f5, knight to d7, and then often you end up playing e6, and this bishop is stuck here, so you have to open it up with c5 or, or e5. So this is basically a carp of Karo Khan for black. So I wasn't too unfamiliar with that. Uh, usually in these positions you play knight f6, which I ended up playing in the game. I think the best move, and during my analysis at home, uh, I definitely... Uh, yeah, I definitely concluded that the best move is h6, simply stopping bishop g5, because after knight f6, which was played in the game, uh, bishop to c2 and c5, which I ended up playing to free up my position, he just plays bishop g5 and it gets very, very tricky. So instead of that, had I played h6 and now bishop c2 in anticipation of knight f6 and e5, which I think is better than c5, then I probably have a perfectly equal position after rook e1, ed4, queen d4, or knight d4, probably queen d4, and I don't know, this, this has to be equal. As I said, instead of that knight f6, bishop c2, and c5 played, and now, again, I haven't checked the game with an engine, nor will I uh, in the near future, because I didn't understand, didn't understand the whole game yet, but I believe... White has an advantage. I don't know how big. I'm definitely sure that for humans, White's position is way easier to play. And I can also say that subjectively during the game, I thought I was completely busted. So my opponent played bishop g5 and I just didn't know what to do. So I ended up taking on, on d4, which I thought was best, and after queen takes d4, I played bishop e7. And now I would love to trade queens, because if we trade queens, then I take with the d8 rook, or with the rook on d8, uh, and if he offers a rook trade, I accept it, and I have enough time for either b6, bishop b7, or b6, bishop a6. And if he wants to infiltrate on d7, he will have to give up his bishop pair on f6, in which case my bishop would be very good. So, of course, he doesn't trade queens. And now, I thought queen h4 was very interesting. Also, queen c3 seemed interesting, but he played queen e5. And now, I, I think I thought for about half an hour here. I just couldn't find the move. Uh, I had no idea what to do. So, my original intention was to play knight g4. And I just couldn't see all the way until something understandable happens in my head. So knight g4, he obviously, well, has to save the bishop, has to save the queen. So queen e4 was the only move in my analysis. And now the only move for black, if he doesn't want to, well, give up his entire equality for the moment or potential equality, then black has to play f5. Now long term this pawn is weak, short term white has tactical problems. So now either queen f4 or bishop takes e7. I was expecting queen f4, which is... I think a more complicated move, and now I have to play e5, and now he has to take on e7, and after queen takes e7, I was expecting rook to e1, and I don't know what's going on here. Um, I still have to develop my bishop somewhere. White has a 3 to 2 pawn majority on the queen side, which could be very strong. The knight could come to g5, the queen could come to g5. My knight doesn't seem that good on g4. I don't know what it's doing there. If I retreat it to f6, then I lose my f5 pawn. Uh, then I also could lose my e5 pawn. Everything seems very loose. And I saw something like this in my head. And then also after knight g4, queen e4, f5, if bishop e7 immediately, then uh, I probably have to take f takes e4. Uh, I don't know. I probably just have to take f takes e4. So this was my analysis. f e4, bishop d8, and now e f3. And now he can either save the bishop. Uh, I'm sorry, he has to save the bishop. So I was thinking bishop h4, take here, king takes. And again, I think white is just better. I would just play king h1, rook g1. I don't know, he has to take care of the f2 pawn for now, but it just seems that this pawn is much weaker than any weakness in white's position. Uh, white still has the 3-2 to two. pawn majority on the queen side. The queens are off, and I, I, I mean, white has the bishop pair in an extremely open position. I don't think my pieces can do any harm to the white king, so I just... 
I don't know who is better here, but I know that white would at least for me be easier to play. So after queen e5, I just didn't like knight g4. I couldn't see what I should be doing. So I came up with a really slow plan, and that's bishop d7, bishop c6. If he pins me, which he did, he played rook f to d1, which I think is the best move. I play queen c8, and, and I hold. I hold. So my bishop is still horrible, but when it gets to c6, I mean, things could get interesting. The problem in this position... If you look at the position here, he's constantly threatening some tricks on h7. So let's say, uh, okay, so the tricks where he can eventually take the piece and mate me on h7. So there were opportunities for that during the game, and they constantly had to keep an eye out for that. So it was very hard to play. After queen c8, I think I had about 45 minutes left, which on move 15 in the semi-slav, which I've played a million times, is really weird. And here he played a move after which uh, I started breathing again. And when I got back to my hotel room, I, I had the position on the board. So I, I played the game out and I came to this move and I thought, well, what, why, why am I so stupid? Why didn't I just... Yeah. Why didn't I just take the c4 pawn? And... And during the game, I, I didn't understand this move because it now stops the communication between the queen and the bishop, which was his main trick in the position. Uh, be, now, in most variations, I did gain a tempo. So now, for example, if I play knight g4, then queen uh, e4 can just be met with bishop takes bishop, and there is no checkmate here. Uh, of course, I don't have a queen to win a piece, but but still, I mean, I can release some of the pressure. So after rook to d3, I was surprised that he did that, uh, and I immediately played bishop c6. And after bishop c6, it was my opponent who said, would you like a draw? I demand a draw. And I said, okay, because I was so relieved not to lose that game. I was struggling so hard to survive the, the opening that I was just relieved that... Okay, I got out of it alive. Okay, let's draw. And I was I was pretty distracted by everything that was going on, I have to say. Uh, and I, I was lucky to... Well, I felt lucky to not to lose this game straight out of the opening because I had no idea what I was doing. But after rook d3, uh, I, of course, didn't even consider queen takes c4. I looked at it and I said, nah. I'm not taking on c4. Now, why? If queen takes c4, the first candidate I could see was simply rook c3. But then, when I started analyzing, there is no way for him to avoid a queen trade or a simplification. So just, let's say queen to d5. This is what I concluded would be the best move. Now, what does he do? If queen d5, then I take with the pawn. If rook c7, for example, then I could go rook a to c8. Everything is defended for the moment. If rook takes b7, then rook takes c2, and bishop f6, and bishop f6, and rook d7. And I could take on b2 with the rook, with the bishop, I could play rook to b8. I have pressure here. I mean, if anybody is better, it's, it's black. After rook d3, I was also afraid of, uh, of queen takes c4. I was afraid of rook to c1, which is just a nothing move, just queen takes a2. So I, I don't know. I think it was just... I was just afraid that something is going to come uh, on these squares. And that being said, I think a way more logical move would have been instead of rook d3, just rook d4, keeping this communication alive and preparing rook h4. And against this, I mean, I don't know what to do. Now, again, I don't know what the engine says. Uh, I haven't looked at the game with an engine. I will. But my conclusion is that I shouldn't have drawn the position because I was better after rook d3. Uh, after bishop c6, I don't know if I'm better or not. My conclusion is that after queen takes c4, black is better, a clear pawn up. It's trickier for black to play than for white, because white still has a lot of attacking pieces. But after I play queen d5 or something similar, then he's just worse. But as I said, game drawn. Uh, if somebody had offered me a draw before rook d3, I would have gladly accepted. I, as I said, didn't even seriously consider queen takes c4. Uh, I, I should have, but yeah. Anyway, round eight. Uh, I'm playing an opponent with a lower rating than mine again, and I have the same position 
or a very similar position to what I had in round 6. So again I play the Kramnik Sicilian and again they don't play the main line. After knight c6, d4, c, d4, knight d4, knight f6 was played and knight c3. Here the main move is of course bishop b4, my opponent played d6. And now again I'm fighting, fighting against small Sicilian Scheveningen center. Last time my opponent were, went for the hedgehog and played knight d7, knight c5. This time the knight is already on c6. So the position is quite different. So in the previous game, I went for the attacking plan of f4, f5, and it had worked out perfectly. In this game, I went for a common Sicilian trick pattern, tactical pattern, which worked. And I got an advantage. Okay, so bishop e3, bishop e7, bishop e2, castles, castles, normal Maroxi bind setup against the small Scheveningen center, a6, preparing perhaps b6, bishop b7, going for the hedgehog. But after rook c1, bishop d7 played. And I think this is a slightly inferior move uh, because now white has to trade, uh, well, black has to trade on d4, put the bishop on c6. And I believe that white always has a fairly pleasant position there. So queen d2, I just want to play rook d1 and then see what, what black does. This is a waiting game most of the time. So knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, queen takes d4 can also be played. Bishop d4 is a bit less... Uh, dangerous. So bishop c6, f3 defending the pawn and queen c7. And queen c7 is is an imprecise move. Uh, it's very hard to develop the queen but queen c7 allows the immediate knight d5 winning the bishop pair. And this is uh, a pattern in, in the Maroxi bind which you just have to know if you play these positions. So knight d5 uh, of course that's not just giving up a piece because if the piece is taken you win the piece back with the pin. Uh, from the c1 rook. Of course, if he doesn't take, then he loses the e7 bishop, which would be even worse than giving up the light squared bishop. Arguably, this is his uh, uh, less good bishop, less dangerous bishop, because all of my pawns are on light squares. And if he gave up his dark squared bishop, well, then a lot of pressure on d6. Also, if he moves the queen, then bishop b6 is a very annoying move, followed, followed up by knight c7 if the queen wanders off to e8. I've won, like, won games like this before. So ed is the normal continuation. cd, now the queen has to move, queen moves to d7, and you win the bishop pair. Pawn takes. Pawn takes. Now, uh, the big advantage I have here, well, I have two big advantages. First one, bishop pair. Second one, superior pawn structure. Now, I don't know the evaluation here, but I, I've analyzed positions like this a lot and I know that the advantage should be substantial whether it's winning depends on, on other features of the position I think on a very high level this should be a winning advantage on my level it's not a winning advantage yet I still have to build on it so I played rook f to d1 simply putting pressure on these two pawns uh, rook f to d8 and queen to c2 queen to c2 in hindsight I was not happy about I mean I'm putting pressure on c6 which is a simple threat uh, but after rook a to c8, I wasn't really happy with, with my position. Uh, I'm sorry, rook d to c8 uh, was played, I believe. Wait, I may have input this game wrong. Wait, let me just check the score sheet. I don't believe he would have hung his a pawn because I think after pawn a6, rook a8, just queen c4 or queen d3. Let me just check the score sheet. Okay, this was move 18. Yeah, it says rook d to c8. I'm sorry, so now I'm going to have to take you through the game from my score sheet because I input it wrong. Excuse me. Uh, here I played bishop e3. And the reason why I played bishop e3 was to increase the pressure here and after d5, which he wants to play to liberate his position, to have just to have, to have the diagonal closed a bit. Uh, queen b7 played in this position and I played b3. Uh, b3 is a slow move, but I want to be able to move my queen and I want to be able to free my position up. And I wasn't afraid of d5. He did play d5, which of course if I take there's a pin on my queen, so he would have a tempo. But this is what I prepared. I prepared 
e5 and of course knight to d7 and f4 and i thought well first of all i i don't have a blockade on the dark squares because he has a knight bishop and the pawn can advance but this pawn would eventually become very weak if he pushes furthermore uh, i wanted to play the position with f4 e5 because i have all of this going on and his light squares are extremely weak i have a light squared bishop he doesn't so my idea was a rook lift the queen on the diagonal bishop there Okay, so after f4, he played a5, which is trying to block the queen side. And now bishop g4. And bishop g4 is an annoying move uh, because it pins the knight to the rook, and it's not really clear what he should do. If he tries to unpin with rook c7, then bishop takes knight, rook takes knight, queen takes c6, and they win a pawn. Uh, same goes for rook d8. So it's, it's kind of an annoying move. Um, h5, of course, is stopped for now. f6 is a very risky move because you allow me to enter via e6 so bishop g4 was part of my plan bishop a3 rook b1 uh, rook to e8 played in this position unpinning and that is i think why uh, that is i think why he played bishop a3 of course to to free up his c6 pawn and now i played rook to d3 and i'm simply preparing a rook lift uh, this is an attacking and defensive move at the same time he played bishop b4 and now i played bishop f2 and this was the final part of my plan. I just wanted to attack. And after bishop f2, g6 was played, which I think is a very provocative move. Uh, after g6, I, I think I made a mistake. Uh, well, okay, rook b to d1 is still okay. I need to centralize my rook. Rook b to d1, and he played rook a to b8, which is also okay. And now I think I went wrong. Uh, in, this position, in this position, I played bishop f3. The idea behind bishop f3 was to increase the pressure on this pawn chain and eventually uh, win the c6 pawn somehow. And also because my bishop wasn't pinning anything, that was that was kind of the point. But yeah, just h4. And I don't think there is a defense to this. I have been looking at this move and I should have played this move for, for here and on the next five turns. But I didn't. So the obvious only defense is h5, but now I believe just bishop to h3 and g4, and his position is basically collapsing. Uh, let's say he tries knight to f8, which is a sensible move, just g4. And if he takes, of course, then rook g3 is coming, h5 is coming. My whole setup that I have been building is, is working, but I didn't use it. So... After rook a to b8, where are we? I played bishop f3, which is... I, I'm, I was kind of ashamed to have played this move. He played rook b to c8, offered the draw. I declined, of course. I didn't give up on my setup yet. I played king h1 first. I wanted to... Well, first of all, get away from this diagonal. Uh, secondly, I wanted to make uh, room for my, for my rook on the g-file. Okay, king h1, rook c to b8, again, just repeating moves. And here I played queen to e2, which is just, uh, I mean, does nothing. This move does nothing. My idea was to increase the pressure here, and after h4, h5, play bishop h5. But I don't think that does much, because he plays queen b5. I'm now in, in trouble, and if I, if, if I do that, I think he has time for c5, for d5, to open up the position and try to... Well, try at least try knight c5, in which case I would have to trade off one of my attacking pieces, and I believe he would be able to equalize. So if h4, knight c5, and I have to trade my queen or my bishop, if I trade my bishop, then his bishop becomes very good, and I don't know. Of course, my attack is still going on, but with a couple of pieces traded off, it should be less effective. Okay, uh, so after queen to b5... I went back to c2, which is sort of admitting defeat, and as I said, I'm not too proud of this game, and here I even played h3. I gave up on my attacking idea completely, even though it works here as well, so just h4, h5, g4, and I should have kept going. But I saw a way to, to try and win this position. Okay, let's get back to the game. Uh, rook b to c8 played. He was again just repeating moves. And I played bishop g4 again. He played rook c to b8, repeating again. And I played rook c1, increasing pressure on c6. Rook b to c8 again. I mean, he is doing nothing. And now I wanted to set up for this. And here is how I wanted to convert. Uh, we have the same position as in the game, I believe, now. So I'm going to switch to that. Uh, okay. 
Okay, okay, so rook b to c8, yes, it is the same position. So this I didn't put before, so I can go back to this. So here I went for bishop takes d7, which may seem like a strange idea, but after queen takes d7, I have bishop c5. And this is a terrible weakness. Queen b7, a3, of course, forcing a trade. My b3 pawn is defended, bishop c5, queen c5. And now uh, I was 99% sure that I know how to convert this without any issues at all. He played queen a6, uh, I played rook d to c3. He played queen to e2, which I had calculated previously. I knew that I could take on a5 and I wasn't really afraid of anything. So I take on a5. Uh, and I, I mean, I think the best move is queen e4, but that's that's not this, that scary. I can just defend like this. Instead of that, he went d4 and I went rook 3 to c2, queen e4 now. Queen to d2 defending, he played rook to b8, I played b4, he played rook to a8, and now this is the turning point in the game. This position is obviously winning for white. Uh, I have several incredibly strong options. Uh, during my analysis at home, uh, or in the bus while waiting on the border, uh, I concluded that rook to e1 is the best move, and either queen f5 or queen d5 uh, just loses on the spot. Uh, if queen d5, then rook c5, queen d7, and probably rook e3 or rook c3, both work just defending this pawn. The pawn is pinned, uh, the rook cannot be taken, then rook b3, and eventually rook takes c6 or queen takes d4. Uh, and this is winning. Instead of that, I went for an immediate conversion because I had overlooked a tactic. And I spotted it immediately after my move. Uh, but I overlooked a tactic which gives him a draw. Now, my opponent is... He is rated 1848. So, about my strength. A bit lower uh, rating-wise. I played rook c4. And... He played rook e to d8, and now I played rook to d1, and I had overlooked something. Okay, so uh, when he takes on a3, I saw this after playing rook c4, I cannot take on, on, on d4. If you want, pause the video, but the, this pawn cannot be taken. Okay, uh, the reason why the pawn cannot be taken is rook takes h3. My, my pawn is hanging because the queen is spinning my g2 pawn. So after playing rook, rook to c4, I saw that I'm losing this pawn and I'm going to eventually have to uh, play king to h2. So after rook to c4 and rook e to d8, uh, should I have defended this pawn? I, I don't know. I thought that this would be just too passive. I didn't want to do that. Maybe still rook to e1 works and going for this. Maybe this was still the best option. I thought that I still had enough to win. So after rook c4, rook e d8, rook d1, rook takes a3, I played king to h2. And then he played a move that just immediately gives him equality. And I wanted to throw up and run away and cry and, and shout. He played g5 and, and now it's game over. It's a draw. Whatever I do, it's a draw. I'd actually analyze this position extensively. There is nothing I can do to win this position. So rook takes d4. Rook takes d4, queen takes d4, queen takes f4, queen takes f4, g takes f4. Whatever I do, it's a draw. This is a drawn endgame. I have too many weaknesses. Rook c1, rook b3, rook c4. He even played f3, which is a mistake because gf3, rook f3, rook c6. But after rook b3, there is no way to make progress. If you want to see how, uh, in tomorrow's uh, endgames, in the, in the study, for the 100-day endgame challenge, this position will be analyzed. Uh, tomorrow, uh, I will be starting simple rook and pawn endgames, where one side is a pawn up, and I will demonstrate how how easily drawing this is, uh, and which rules cause that to happen. So basically, after rook c4, this is what happened in the game, king g7, rook g4 check. I'd even made a mistake chasing the queen away, the king away back to its ideal square. There is no way for me to make progress here because the, the rook is cutting my king off from uh, moving up the board. This pawn is going to drop and even if these pawns are traded off, it's a draw. Even if these pawns and the rooks are traded off, it's still a draw. Therefore, it's a draw. So, 
after eight rounds, as I said, I didn't play the last round. After eight rounds, I got my rating from uh, 1893 to 1909, which is an improvement, so I'm happy. I'd obviously lost a ton of points in this game, and uh, in the previous game I should have played for a win. In round six, I should have won. I had a plus 20 advantage, so a lot of points were dropped. These last two rounds, I have to say, I, uh, especially the last round, because this game I played after I'd found out that I don't have a way to get, to get home easily. I wasn't really focused on chess. Yeah, before I, I forget, uh, my condolences to Mr. Levon Aronian. Uh, I, I mean, I obviously don't know the man. I didn't don't know his wife, but he seems like a very nice person and I wish him all the best in, in these hard times and yeah, my condolences. I, that's a, it's always horrible when something like that happens. I hope that he's going to be okay and I hope he deals with it the best way possible. Okay, uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you learned something from my passive play uh, in this game, just age four and I, I yeah. Okay, I have to practice being more aggressive. Uh, yeah, thanks. Stay tuned for more chess. Uh, on Thursday, we are continuing the endgame series. On Friday, the middle game series is continuing. Uh, and during the week, since I'm still at home, I don't have anywhere to go. I will continue the London system uh, series. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.